Well, you're beating them so far, Ian. Yeah. How are things? Uh, at the moment, um, they're quite good. I mean, he, he didn't actually say I'd only got eight months. He said that was the worst case scenario. He said, that on the other end, it could be eight years. So um, the treatment I've been having has had a, a major effect on the, on, the, on the cancer, and it's gone down below the resolution of the screen now, of the CT machine, the scanner. Mm. And the last scan I had was about a month ago, <clears throat> and it's off the screen. They're so small now they don't show up, which means the chemo that I've been having has, has really been affected. So he's now put me on a new chemo to kick it while it's down, as it were. And I, I, I have this thing called a Hickman line, which is built into my chest, straight onto an artery, and a tube comes out. An operation is necessary, obviously, for this. And I have a little nozzle here. I can't show you because I have a T-shirt on, but a little nozzle Then You plug the bottle of chemo straight onto the nozzle, unclip it, and it goes straight into your, into your vein. And it's a very gentle way of administering chemotherapy. It doesn't make... As you can see, it doesn't make your hair fall out. It does make it a little bit thinner, but it doesn't make you nauseous, and it doesn't, you know, all the usual things yeah. we hear about um, after effects and side effects, you don't get any of those. But consequently, your spirit is able to keep charging up a bit, you know, you don't, I'm not like that. Plus, it was diagnosed very early before it had started hurting or anything. What were the symptoms of this here? Well, two and a half years ago, I thought I had something like, well, a fashionable disease of irritable bowel syndrome. And I was being sick and I had cramps. And I thought it was jet lag. I was in Los Angeles doing, doing a bit in a film. I came back, I saw my doctor. He thought it was probably that as well, jet lag, and, and just an upset stomach until a month later. And then I really was getting pain. So I went back to see my doctor, and he said, straight away, specialist. So I went to see a, a surgeon, a, a specialist cancer surgeon. And he went, you've got a stricture. He said, it's probably as big as a signet ring on your colon, which is stopping anything going through. And he operated the next day <clears throat> and removed it. Um, and then I was in hospital a couple of weeks with that. Um, and he said, you have got now a chance that nothing will come back. That was a, a tumour, a stricture, a tumour. Um, but he said, you've got to be checked up every six months because it can go from the colon, it can go across to your liver. Well, in January this year, as you just said, it was, it was found on my liver on a scan. And since then he put me with a specialist, cancer specialist, who's been treating it ever since. So I've been plugging up every... Well, my wife can do it. She, she plugs it up on a Tuesday. Don't tell me the details. <laughs> OK. Don't tell me the details. There's a needle going into you, then. It's not a needle. It's, it's, it's already... I've got, a, I've got a nozzle. It's like a tube comes out of me that's fixed to my vein. So you've got to be very hygienic with it. That's the only thing you've got to worry about. Are you in pain, Ian? No pain at all, no. No, I'm very lucky. It's early diagnosis, plus I'm with, you know, the top, top of the range doctors. And this, is, this is top of the range treatment. This yeah, is this state is of the art treatment. Cutting edge, yeah. I mean, my surgeon is a very humorous man. He said, um, you're with a guy who's at the cutting edge, but he's not 10 feet in front of the cutting edge because they're the dangerous bastards, right? They're the ones who experiment on you, you know? Yeah. So my guy's bang on the cutting edge. And he said he had to keep your mouth connected. <laughs> That was my surgeon. <laughs> your surgeon said that. Yeah. Tell them, tell them. I tell said, them. well, my job is to make sure your mouth's still connected to your arsehole, basically. <laughs> It's a graphic description, yeah. but it describes it very well indeed. Dear, oh dear. Now, Mr. Geldof announced on the air that you were dead. He got it slightly Bob. wrong. Yeah. He got it slightly wrong. He got it slightly wrong. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, our guitar player, also works with Bob in Bob's yes. band. So we got messages backwards and forwards afterwards. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, my little statement is luckily nobody listens to XFM radio <laughs> anyway. Especially so, my so, auntie. Some guy just rang in and said, did you hear? He yeah. is dead. Yeah. It's a slightly under-researched statement, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> anyway, he apologised. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a genuine mistake. Oh, yeah. You're an old mate of his. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, now, as I'm, uh, I'm just thinking of, of your reasons to be cheerful um, song. Yeah. Not, not many reasons to be cheerful at the moment. Or well, not, more um, than you'd probably think. I've got two little nippers. I've got a little boy of one and a half, another one of three and a half. They're, they're good reasons to be cheerful. I've got hope. Um, because my doctors are both brilliant. Um, it is in abeyance at the moment, or in remission, so, yeah. And I've got another reason to be cheerful. He's made a good record, and the boys are back together. Yeah. Um, on a mission again. I mean, we've stayed together as a band. We play, we've played Dublin probably more times than we've played London in yeah. the last five years. But, yeah. Um, and we kept our spirits up, but now we've got a record that we can play. Yeah. Makes a lot of difference. It, make, it makes you feel like you're on a mission again. So that's, that aspect is great, you know. So I actually do feel very... It's, it's a great band, <clears throat> and it's, it's yeah. a, ter a terrific group. But I would have thought, and I think probably you're going to give me the answer, that 
I expect for this, that it wouldn't seem to be the best treatment for what's wrong with you, getting out on stage and belting it out. And oh, the, come the on, trouble man. My blood's trouble. flying around. Really? My adrenaline's soaring. My spirits yes, are up there. I think the adrenaline has something yeah, to do with it. Yeah, I'm sure know. it does. Really? I may just be... I mean, I don't go on about it too much because this is still no. very special and poor people maybe not be able to afford it and the British National Health Service certainly they haven't got this happening all over England yet or, or Scotland. But um, it's, you know, it's the beginning of something. I know they've got Liverpool, they've got Hickman Line, and some hospitals in London. So it is getting through to the, to the people. So I just feel I'm, in a way, it's quite an exciting time. I know it's exciting. a bit daft, yes, but, so you say that, but you know, exciting, yes. it's a little bit exciting to be at, at this yeah. kind of... Yeah. You know, um, diseases in general are on, you know, on the run around the world. Um, I, you know, I, I, you're probably going to ask me about UNICEF in a minute, but... Um, you know, we're getting rid of polio, and it's amazing, really. I mean, I get a bit emotional thinking about it. It's a kind of time when um, AIDS in America is 47% improvement in the survival rate in the last five years. Yeah. And it's not, you know... And, and what did you do <clears> for <throat> UNICEF? You went off. You're, you're beginning to fill up now about, about polio. Well, how old were you when you got polio? Uh, I was seven. And last year I got asked to join UNICEF to be a kind of an apprentice ambassador. And we go, well, last year we went to Zambia, my friend Derek and me, and the UNICEF party and some journalists. I was there to observe it. Uh, it's an immunisation programme. And it's called National Immunisation Day. The vaccine has to be refrigerated. And in a hot country, it means really, if you're going to do the kids, you do them all at once. So they did 2 point, was it 2.1 or 2.2 .2 million children in over two day period in Zambia. And it has to be organised to come from Brussels, go to the Lusaka depot where all the big supermarket freezers are kept. Then it's decanted into little boxes that keep it cold for 48 hours. It's got to be minus five, the vaccine. You get to the baby in the middle of nowhere, in the bush, 100 miles from anywhere, it's this little bottle, it's got 20 doses, and you go drip, drip, two little drops in a baby's mouth, protects it from polio. And uh, I went out there as a, as a witness, really, and we watched... UNICEF's activities out there. I came back, I did about, I don't know, 40 interviews about it. That was my job to yeah, do yeah, that yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this year, like three weeks ago, we went to uh, Sri Lanka, which is a slightly step up, because that's called a day of tranquility, because there's a war going on in Sri Lanka. And uh, they wouldn't let us go to Sudan, um, or Afghanistan, or anywhere like that. It's too, basically too bloody dangerous. But in, in Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers um, have a truce for two days, and the government troops they stop shooting each other and they immunise all the kids. You're crazy. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy. On crazy. Monday, bang, bang again. Crazy. It's insane. What a change in your life from the hell-raising days. <laughs> I mean, really, I'll still raise amazing. a little. Yeah. I know. I know, my know, days but, <laughs> I know indeed. But, uh, um, and there was also treatment available when you got polio, of course. What was uh, it? No, the no. Salk vaccine yes, was being salk. tested in 1949. Yeah. But, you know, it's, yeah. it's still like a good job. Listen, is it true that Andrew Lloyd Webber made you an offer? to write the, the lyrics for Cats. Well, in fact, I think T.S. Eliot wrote most of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. sorry, sorry to write that. But yeah. um, I did get a tug, as we call it. Yeah. Um, but I gave him a blink, as we call it. Yeah, why? Uh, oh, you really want to know. Yes. I don't like it, what he does. You know, I shouldn't, it's not, you know, no, really musicians shouldn't knock each other at all, but it ain't my cup of tea, put it that way. Mm. Just not your cup of tea. No. You would have been a multi-millionaire, Ian. Yeah, well, I don't mind Richard Skinner having a dush. You know, he's welcome to it. Mm. But no, it wasn't Richard Skinner. It was Richard Stilgoat. <laughs> Richard Stilgoat was. And, and Cameron McIntosh told me recently, if you're going to drop names, I want to be in there with the best of them. Cameron McIntosh told me recently that 20 years later, the pe so many people would not think, wouldn't dream of investing in cats. Yeah. And they had to make do with a lot of small investors. Yeah. And true. each of those has made... 200% on the money every year, each year for 20 years. No, it's a, it's a money spinner. It's a money spinner. But, Fantastic. Uh, you know, what can I say? Do you love performing? I love it, yeah. I, I you... especially love it with the blockheads. Yeah. I've tried it with other people and um, I love it with the blockheads because the blockheads are the best team of musicians I've ever worked with. So it's simple. But I think they're the best team of musicians. Well, I bet not say. And, and you, you said somewhere in an interview I read that words are attracted to you, that, that you yeah. love words and lyrics and... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a struggle with it. I find it... I sometimes keep them at bay. I don't know why. I worked one the other day. I'm a people kind of person. I'm a geezer kind of guy. I like that one. 
It's a bit crummy. It might be a bit, it's a bit cockney.